I know several of you are kind of like, you got thrown into the mix here because you're visiting family in town or things like that. And so I want to do a quick recap with where we've been at, what we've been talking about on Sunday mornings. And I'll try to be brief, kind of keep things moving. But we've been doing this series called Discovering the Bible or Rediscovering the Bible. Depends on, I guess, how familiar you are with it in the first place. And one of kind of our ambitions with that has been when we open up something, especially the Bible, we bring our ideas and maybe how we've been raised or what we've been taught in the past, we automatically kind of import all those ideas into our understanding of the Bible. And what we want to do is kind of try to step back into the shoes of the people who were writing the Bible in the first place and look at it through their eyes instead of just through the impressions and the way that it hits us. And so we've been looking at uh, better ways to do that uh, as we read our own Bible And I'm going to move through some slides as well, just to kind of do a little recap from the last couple of weeks. Um, So we've been looking at specifically narratives in the Bible, which are the stories. That's 40-some percent of the Bible are just these stories. Maybe you heard different stories as a kid growing up, or you've encountered it, but it's so-and-so's life and the events and things that happened. And so that's kind of the section that we're focused on right now. And so just a quick recap of where we've been. Uh, What are narratives in the Bible? They're different characters in a setting. And they're experiencing a series of different events. And these are scenes. And these aren't just random, and it's not just facts from people's life. Like, you know, if you wrote somebody's biography, or like, yesterday, I went to lunch. And after that, you know, I got together with my friend. And after that, I watched a movie on Netflix. It's not that kind of thing. These are specifically arranged to teach something, to communicate some kind of a message. They've been arranged by a writer to form a plot or a storyline because that writer wants to communicate something to us. And so in order to understand what they're trying to communicate, we kind of have to step back and understand you know, the narrative itself and where it's going and these different events and the different scenes that make it. And there's a plot that happens, a storyline. So these characters are going to encounter something new or challenging or unexpected. There's probably going to be problems, and those things are eventually going to lead to this ultimate conflict or kind of issue, and then some way that's going to be resolved, and as a result of it, these characters are going to be changed. And the Bible authors specifically, and God's Holy Spirit, if you believe that this is an inspired document, that God's really moving these people, and behind this, as the Bible itself claims, um, are trying to communicate specific things to us and give us challenges through these characters' lives and what happens and cause us to think about things we wouldn't have entertained previously as well. Um, as we read these stories, last week we talked about the characters in it and how the Bible stories are different than a novel that you would pick up and read today in several different ways. One, uh, our novels, they get really descriptive and they describe the characters, their clothes and their facial expressions and all this stuff, their accessories. But in the Bible, it's really stripped down. Uh, These physical descriptions aren't often given, but when they are, it's really significant to the story. So it's kind of a minimalist approach. Also, the names of Bible characters often indicate more about their role in the story. For example, Abram's name, who we talked about last week in our little example story, his name means exalted father. And so there's a key element, like his role in this story is to be some important father and in the case of the Bible, from whom a specific nation of people come from that God tries to reach the world through. Um, Also, characters, circumstances, and actions, they're going to be realistic. Uh, You're not going to find a lot of superheroes in the Bible, and you're not going to find a lot of supervillains in the Bible, although there are a couple. Most of these characters are going to be relatable. You're going to see them succeed. You're going to see them on the mountaintop. You're going to see them in the pit of depression. You're going to see them fail, just like us. And so we're going to see ourselves mirrored in those characters. We also talked about settings last week and how it's a place that a narrative takes place, the time and history, and maybe the pace at which it goes. Um, And these settings in the Bible, they stack on top of each other, and they assume that you've read the things that come before, and in some cases, the things that come after. And we'll kind of illustrate this this morning as we go along. Um, But things that are set in the same places tend to end up working out the same way. And so you see a pattern emerge. Uh, things that happen, for example, in Egypt, it's kind of unknown. And sometimes things go really well in Egypt, and oftentimes things don't go so well in Egypt. But it's, it's always a, you know, when somebody heads to Egypt, who knows what's going to happen? And different settings are like that. Uh, they, they teach us something over time, and the results are similar. Um, sometimes the authors, you expect something to happen in a setting. Like, oh no, Jesus is headed down to Egypt with his family. Probably something terrible is going to happen. And occasionally it doesn't. works out really well. 
And so there's reasons why narratives will flip things as well, and authors will flip things up to cause us to think or notice something. We talked about that last week. Um, here's kind of the key phrase I want us to focus on this morning. Again, when we isolate an individual scene from its larger narrative, we end up getting messages that the author and the Spirit of God who moved the author never intended. And we're really good, I think, as American Christians about doing this. We pick out a specific story from the Bible and we read it and we're like, okay, what does that mean for me? And last week we illustrated this. We kind of misinterpreted a Bible passage um, just to kind of illustrate how this works. For example, we'll pull out something like Genesis 12 is what I picked on last week. And here's the story. I'm going to step aside a little bit. I think you can still, I think people online can still see me, but I want you to be able to read the words a little bit better up here. But um, so this is a story. It says, there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt to stay there for a while because the famine in the land was severe. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, look, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is his wife, they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. Please, say you're my sister, so things will go well with me because of you, and my life will be spared on your account. And then here's how it plays out. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And this is like, I mean, this is like, like beautiful, beautiful, extravagantly beautiful woman from the way the text reads. Pharaoh's officials saw her and praised her to Pharaoh, so the woman was taken into Pharaoh's household. Um, he treated Abram well because of her, and Abram acquired flocks and herds and male and female donkeys and male and female slaves and camels. But the Lord struck Pharaoh and his household with severe plagues because of Abram's wife Sarai. So Pharaoh sent for Abram and said, What have you done to me? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she was my sister? So I took her as my wife. Here's your wife. Take her and go. And then Pharaoh gave his men orders about him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, to the desert, he and his wife and all he had, and Lot with him. Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. And so maybe we open our Bibles and we encounter this story, and we're like, okay, what kind of conclusions can I make from this? What, what kind of principles can I draw from this story? This is one scene in many scenes that make up a story or a narrative about Abram. But we tend to isolate it and say, what can I get from this story? And last week, we were kind of facetious a little bit. Here's what we could get from that story if we're not careful. Here's some conclusions we could draw. One, it's best to relocate in times of famine. Abram did, so I guess if we're in a food shortage, we should relocate too to where the food is. Two, marrying an attractive person complicates your life. So keep that in mind if you're single today. Um, it's going to complicate life. Three, asking other people to lie, it's beneficial. Because Abram asked Sarai to lie. As a result of it, he gained all these camels and livestock and slaves. And things went really, really well. Not only that, but lying can make us rich. And it made Abram really rich. But Pharaoh, he accidentally took someone as his wife who he just thought was the man's sister. If you accidentally wrong someone, then God drops the hammer on you, right? So don't do anything on accident, unintentionally, God forbid. <laughs> and then six, God approves of lying. He must, because Abram and Sarai, they didn't have any negative consequences in that story. And they got rich as a result of it. So... That's what we can take away from that story in the Bible. So, you know, if you're studying that one day for yourself and you're reading it, it's like, okay, God, um, show me opportunities to lie more. Um, make me rich through my deception of other people and help me because my wife or my husband is kind of attractive. Help me not to be paranoid because, I mean, who knows what's going to happen as a result of it. And that's what you get from the Bible. Like, okay, thank you, Lord. Amen. <laughs> Look for opportunities to be deceptive and lie today. All right. And so what we're trying to do is not isolate a scene from the bigger story. And we're trying to read responsibly uh, when we read Bible narratives. And so this morning what I want to do is I want us to step back through that, but in a way that's a little bit more responsible. And this is kind of an approach. I'm, I'm going to give us one approach. And these are some questions that you might ask as you walk through a story in the Bible to try to get from it what the writers are trying to communicate. 
There are other questions, which are probably great and I haven't thought of because, you know, I don't know everything, um, that you may think of and other things to ask when you read through Bible narratives. But here's a sample of what you might do to better understand things. How can we discover the messages that were intended? Uh, Well, we can ask these types of questions. And notice I have we highlighted as well because this is not an individual effort. We really need each other to better read our Bibles. Uh, The Bible for for millennia has been read in community. And now because we have the printing press and our phones, our Bibles on our phones, on apps, it's become a very individualized thing where you actually have the luxury of reading a Bible just yourself and sitting down or pulling out your phone and scrolling through some stories in the Bible for yourself. For centuries and centuries, people did not have that luxury. And so it was always a community effort which I think we lose a little bit of that. We lose input from other people and other people's opinions. And so as we work through the Bible, it's okay to read it for ourselves, but it's great to take maybe the ideas that we've collected and to bounce those ideas off other people or maybe even read through similar sections and meet to discuss it. We do things called Bible studies, and that's really why, so that we can get other people's perspectives as they're reading. They may see things and notice things that we wouldn't, and we'll be better informed as a result of it. Um, And so there's a few basic questions we should probably ask ourselves. First of all, when we approach the Bible, there's different kinds of literature in it. And we're going to talk about how to read the other kinds of literature next. But there are these narratives, these stories. And so we're talking about how to approach that now. There's also poetry. About 33% of the Bible is poetry. And you look at poetry different than you would something that's more of a story, a narrative. And then there's also uh, what's called speeches or discourse or letters would fall into that category, but it's these, these logical arguments that are presented, whether in a speech form or a letter form, to take you from point A to point B and help you draw some conclusions about what to do. And all those different types of literature we have to read slightly differently um, because the author, again, is using a different type of literature to engage us and to teach us. So what kind of literature is this? And the story that we picked on today, it was a narrative. It was just a story, basically. And so with with Genesis 12, we want to ask ourselves, well, where does this narrative, where does this story actually begin and end? Because it doesn't begin where we started, and it doesn't end where we left off just a few moments ago. Um, We have to kind of read before and read after. And if we do that, uh, we're looking for shifts in things. We're looking for a new set of characters, we're looking for a new setting, and we're looking for this plot, this storyline to kind of wrap up. And so those are clues as to where the narrative begins and ends. And if we trace it back a little bit, we find that in chapter 11, verse 27, that's where we get introduced to this whole new set of characters and where they're at and their setting. And so then we encounter over the next chapters uh, some new and unusual things happening and some problems and conflicts, which is what chapter 12 is. And it's all building up to some events. And then finally, in Genesis chapter 25, like 13 chapters, 14 chapters later, the story finally resolves. And then we get a new set of characters and a new setting and a new story that kicks off. So if you really want to understand chapter 12, We might have to read 14 whole chapters to get the bigger picture of the story, which is maybe a hard sell. Maybe it's something that we do over a half a month or something like that. It takes us time. That's okay, because we want to look at the story as a whole. Um, We need to figure out where it starts and where it ends, and we can tell by the shift in characters and shift of setting and a different storyline completely. Um, Another question, where does this story, this narrative, fit into the story of the Bible? We talked about how the Bible has one overarching story. And this was a kind of a little bit of a, I know you can't read that from where you are, most of you at least. I don't think I can. Um, Those different high points, it starts with God making a good world and attracts through humanity rebelling against God and things go downhill. And then eventually God starts to try to engage humanity again through a family, Abraham and his family and his descendants. And things look like they're going up. But then these people who have all the advantages in the world, they start failing just like everyone else. And then finally, God's ultimate plan to try to rescue humanity out of what we've gotten ourselves into uh, begins with Jesus, and then things are on the up and up from there. But there's about 14 different points in the Bible story, and I get you a copy of this, or you can watch one of the past weeks online where this is showed online and kind of get your bearings that way. But, but there's one overarching story to the Bible. So where does it plug in there? This is toward the beginning. This is where God starts to, he, he's tried to reach out to humanity as a whole, but people have been largely disinterested, and so he focuses on one family to try to show the world what 
people who are really living by what God calls good and bad, what their life might be like. And so he has this experiment with a family, Abraham's family, that becomes the nation of Israel. And again, the experiment doesn't work out so well over the long run, but, but he's engaging Abraham and his family. And so that's where it fits into the, the whole story of the Bible. Another thing, where does this scene fit into the plot of the narrative? I've got Cinderella's coach back there. So if you know anything about that story, right, there's a point in time where Cinderella and these, these wicked stepsisters who come into the picture, they're going to the ball, and Cinderella's stuck at home cleaning, and fairy godmother shows up and makes what's very impossible probable by whipping up a coach out of a pumpkin and turning mice into coachmen and things like that. And that's the part where the story, like there's some possibilities and some hope that enter in. And so that scene has a very specific purpose in the story. And our scene about Abram going down to Egypt, lying about his wife's identity, that fits in for a specific purpose in, Abram, in Abram's story in the Bible as well. Um, it's developing this relationship between God uh, and Abram's family, but it's really the fourth scene, what we found in chapter 12, what we read a few moments ago, it's really the fourth scene in this larger narrative. And so uh, where does it fit into the plot? We really have to read the whole narrative to figure that out. Um, but really this whole story of Abram's life, it's about him learning to trust God. And he has some incredible leaps of faith he does things that hardly anybody would be willing to do. And early on in the story, and then he also trusts in himself or just drops the ball and really doesn't want to trust God with certain things in his life as well. And so all these scenes are showing us pieces of that overall picture of what it's like to walk by faith. And the overall pictures we get is some days we succeed and some days we fail, right? And God's leading us up to maybe bigger successes, but realistically, most people have some successes and some failures, and that's what we see represented with Abram's life as well. But really, to figure out where it fits, we have to read the whole story. But just to give us a little bit of background, that was scene four, chapter 12, that we read about him lying and things like that. But here's scene one, scene two, and scene three. I want to show you how this sets up and how the scenes kind of transition so that it'll help you walk through this. This is more of a like, instead of you sitting and me teaching you things that I found in the Bible, this is more like a workshop this morning because we're just experimenting, trying to figure out how to read the Bible more responsibly when it comes to stories. So this is scene one. It introduces our characters. It says, these are the family records of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, it's more genealogies, Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. And so there's the dad, the sons, Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran's son Lot, who's Abram's uh, nephew. Haran died in his native land in Ur of the Chaldeans during his father Terah's lifetime. Abram and Nahor took wives. Abram's wife was named Sarai. So, okay, he's married, Sarai's his wife. And Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was the daughter of Haran, the father of both Milcah and Iscah. Sarai was unable to conceive. She didn't have a child. And that's strange because it doesn't normally tell us about the characters, but it specifically says Sarai, she hasn't been able to have a child. She deals with infertility. And that's going to be super important to the whole story. So we know who the characters are. We know a couple details. Uh, we know that Abram, uh, he's married to Sarai, and Sarai has not been able to have a child. Um, and so those are key elements for the story. That's scene one. We're just going to introduce the characters. Here's scene two. The Lord said to Abram, so this is a personal conversation, one day God shows up somehow or speaks or communicates in some way, doesn't tell us, to Abram. And he interrupts Abram's normal little life. We find out later on that Abram is 75 years old when God just interrupts his life. Think about that. How many of you are in your 70s right now? You know, you've kind of got things figured out, right? Maybe got some plans. Life has taken a certain shape. Not interested in making major changes at this point. But God steps in and he says, go away from your land, your relatives, and your dad's house to the land that I'll show you. So we're going to uproot you at 75 and totally move you to a place unknown. I'll show you when you get there. And I'll make you into a great nation, your family. Now, they have no kids because they can't have kids. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. These are grand promises to a 75-year-old man with no kids. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse anyone who treats you with contempt. 
And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So you and your family, of which you don't have one at this point because it's just you and your wife, you're going to bless all the nations on earth eventually. These are crazy promises. And so we find out in the next scene, this is God's approach, God's conversation. That's scene two. Scene three, so Abram went. He says, all right, I'll do it. That's a major step of faith, isn't it? At 75 years of age with no kids and no presumably ability to have kids at this point in time in life. So he went. It's a big step of faith, as the Lord had told him. It says, and Lot went with him. And that's kind of peculiar because he told him to go away from all of his relatives. But yet Lot is hanging on. And we'll find out something about Lot in just a moment as we go through this example story. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all his possessions and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, uh, it says Abram passed through the land to the site of Shechem at the Oak of Morah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I'll give this land. Great promise. Only problem is he doesn't have any. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. It says from there, he moved on to the hill country east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent in Bethel on the west of Ai, with Bethel on the west and Ai in the east. He built an altar to the Lord there, and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram journeyed by stages to the Negev, which is the south desert. Negev just means dry place or desert. And so, um, so that's scene three. And then scene four is when the famine hits, and he goes down to Egypt, and he lies, and all those things. So the first couple of scenes, I mean, they really present him as taking some major leaps of faith. But then his humanity comes out in scene four, and you see how this faith and walking by faith in certain contexts and times can be such a struggle. And so that's how the overall scene develops, and the narrative develops. But really to get a complete picture of where scene one, two, three, four, and all of them fit, you'd have to keep reading for several more chapters to get the whole big picture of the story. And so next, we might want to ask ourselves, okay, let's look at this scene, scene four that we read at the beginning of the service today. Uh, what message might that scene about Abram lying to Pharaoh be communicating in context of the entire plot? So stepping back, looking at the big picture, probably not that lying is beneficial. Probably not just something about being careful if you have an attractive spouse, because the big picture is about faith. And so should we see scene four as, you know, license to lie? Or should we see scene four as perhaps a failure to live by faith? Because it is hard in certain circumstances. Here's some possibilities. And we can't really answer this question until we, again, read the entire story. But here's some ideas. And maybe as you talk with people or you mull this over in your mind, other ideas might come to mind as well. This is not just... There's not like two or three definite possibilities here. We're kind of made to chew on these things and think about these things. But here's some possibilities. Um, maybe what scene four is communicating is that when uh, life gets tough, because, you know, things have been worked out fairly well, but when life gets tough, Abram's family tends to come up with their own solutions to problems. You know, there's a famine, so we've got to move. Or uh, Pharaoh might be interested in my wife, so we've got to lie about it. Maybe that scene is intended to, to communicate that when Abram's tested, he doesn't uh, trust God's promise to bless him in the land that he showed him. Because Abram said, I'll, I'll show you this place. When you get there, I'll bless you. But yet there's a famine. So maybe Abram should have stayed put and said, well, you know, if I will just stay here, God will take care of my needs. That's a possibility. Um, Maybe Abram's issue is that he doesn't trust God to protect him. So going to Egypt is fine. It makes sense. There's a famine. But he should just say, you know, God's given me these promises. And so instead of fearing for my life and assuming I'll be killed, I should trust that God will protect me to ensure that these promises that he's made will actually take place. Maybe scene four is supposed to show us what happens when Abram doesn't trust God, that he doesn't become a blessing to the nations, he actually brings plagues on other nations and becomes kind of a curse to other nations when he doesn't act in faith. Maybe that's part of the message that scene four is intended to communicate. But we have to read the whole thing. So we kind of have to stick this on the back burner and read through the rest of the story, but ask these kinds of questions. What is this scene meant to tell me in light of the whole story? 
Here's some other good questions that you might ask as you work through these Bible stories. Um, are names or, and descriptions of characters and places, are they significant? We talked about some tools last week to figure out what names and places in the Bible mean. And if you want to figure out, if you want a, a good synopsis, um, I use a site called blueletterbible.org. <laughs> And, and last week, if you look on the, the service, the recap online on our YouTube channel, there's more information about that, how to access that. I could probably put a link up at some point in time this week um, to that as well if you're interested in accessing it. But there's different tools available to figure these things out. But for example, a few of the names in this story that could be significant are Abram's name, because it means exalted father. And that's key because he's not a father and he's 75 years old. Okay, some details that are key beyond the age that most people have kids. Sarai means, it means my princess or my powerful woman. And in some ways, she has a very powerful personality. We know she is infertile and she's very beautiful. And both of those descriptors play a part in the story. So those few details are very significant. Lot as well, his name is in the story. And last week we mentioned that his name means, it literally means a fabric that clings to you, like a veil that's over your face or a garment that's really tight fitting. And he is just the most clingy thing in this story. Everywhere Abram goes, it's like nephew Lot is just traipsing there, following along. And he can't quite, you know, spread his wings and get out and do his own thing. He's just super clingy. And so that's interesting because it tells us more about him and his nature. We talked about settings last week as well. And so with respect to this story, settings, not only settings, but, but key words and themes. And at the first read, if you're new to the Bible, these things may not stick out at first. Uh, it might take rereading or even spending some time becoming more familiar with the Bible. So some of these, you're like, I've heard that place before, or I've heard of that word somewhere before, or that theme like, it's not the first time. And as you spend more time with the Bible, you realize, oh, these things are repeated. So we might not recognize. But with scene four, we, we get introduced to this theme of famine. And famine comes up over and over again in the Bible and has certain similarities. Oftentimes, things don't work out so well when there's times of famine. And then there's a few situations where God lifts people up in times of famine. So that's a key theme, and maybe there's some patterns that we start to see with famines. There's a phrase, down to Egypt. And normally when people head down to Egypt, again, it's kind of a mixed bag, but a lot of times things don't work out so well when you go to Egypt. And so you see that pattern emerge. There's a couple words. Pharaoh, he sees Abram's wife, and he takes her. And if you've read the chapters previous to this, you think, hmm, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they see the fruit and they take it. And it doesn't work out so well for them. And those phrases are repeated dozens of times throughout the Bible where people see things and they take things. And most of the time, it's bad. <laughs> and so you see that emerge and you're like, oh, I see where this story is going that's not a good thing when people are seeing things and taking things, at least in most instances. And if they see it and they take it and it turns out really well, then that's a clue to really pay attention because the author is purposefully doing something and having the opposite thing occur to really cause that individual or that character to stand out and tell you something about their ability to maybe resist temptation or something. And so you're learning about those characters. Um, Say you are my sister. That phrase happens. Abram uses it again. His son uses it. They pull that same deception repeatedly. And then Pharaoh and plagues. Have you ever heard about Pharaoh and plagues before? That happens after. And so you wouldn't know it by reading Genesis 12, but if you keep reading the Bible and then you end up in Exodus, the early chapters of Exodus, you realize, oh, there's a Pharaoh and there's plagues and that didn't end well the first time. And the result of the first time was him sending Abram and his descendants away from Egypt. And you're like, oh, maybe Pharaoh's going to, through some plagues, send Israel, who's Abram's descendants, away from Egypt. And so the writers, they're kind of like leading you on with these breadcrumbs to show you where things are headed. And so there's clues into to where stories are headed through these repeated words and themes. A couple more questions. Um, what significant questions have been left unanswered? And this is where really discussing things with other people is important and valuable. 
For example, how long has this famine been going on in the place where Abram's been living, in the land that God led him to? I don't know. It'd be really helpful, wouldn't it? Because if it's only been going on for two weeks, maybe Abram should just stay put and wait for the rain clouds to show up. But if it's been going on for years, then you realize, you know, Abram's done everything he can. And so his motive is probably good in trying to go to Egypt to find food. That'd be really helpful. But the Bible authors don't tell us. And so maybe they want us to focus on something else, but it's unanswered. How long was Abram in Egypt? How long did this whole thing and this deception last for? I don't know. Why did Abram ask Sarai to say she was his sister? Sounds random, right? If I told Christine, hey, can you just tell somebody that you're my sister so they don't kill me? Later on in the story, we actually find out why Abram said that, but we don't know that here. Uh, How did Sarai feel about deceiving Pharaoh? I mean, was it like, oh, Abram, I really don't want to do that. I just want to tell him that I'm your wife. I don't want to pretend to be someone that I'm not. Um, Or was she like, sounds good to me. I don't know. Would Pharaoh really have killed Abram for his wife? Or was it just paranoid Abram, you know? I mean, I don't know. I guess he could have. He was king, but would that have really happened? Why did Pharaoh give Abram so many gifts? Was it cultural? I don't know, because he like lavishes more livestock and slaves and all these things on Abram as a result of that. Why did God send plagues on Pharaoh's household? Because Pharaoh, he was like the most innocent guy in this whole story. He just thought he married somebody's sister. So why plagues? Um, How far did Pharaoh's relationship with Sarai go? He married her, but like, did they have a physical relationship? Were they married for months? Like, I don't know. How long did this go on? We don't know. Um, Was Abram rich before he went to Egypt? He had some stuff, but I mean, I don't know how wealthy he was. It would be helpful to know those things but the authors haven't chosen to focus our attention on those things. Um, What do we see from this scene, again, in context of the larger story about human nature and God's ideals? Here's some possibilities, but again, this isn't an exhaustive list. This is just a few ideas that came to my mind, and you might see totally different things, which is why it's so valuable, again, to read the Bible and discuss it in community with other people. Um, Here's some questions I had about human nature. Um, or things that I, I think you know, might be revealed about human nature is a better way to put it, I guess. Um, I think it's human nature. In this scene, maybe it's human nature to fear what might happen because with Abram, it's not like he knows Pharaoh's going to try to kill him. He's just obsessed with the maybes. But isn't that so us? Well, I don't know. This might happen, so I can't do that because, I mean, it could. Like, think about the worst here, you know. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Maybe it's human nature to use deception for self-preservation. Well, I feel like I might be threatened, so let's just lie a little bit here. Does that sound kind of human? Maybe. Um, It's human nature to see and desire and take beautiful women. It's probably a true statement. huh? Maybe this story, the scene in the story, teaches us things like that. Like, when we're dealing with humans like us, we need to be aware of these tendencies. Um, it's human nature to rule and to be ruled. Uh, we see some people being willing to be ruled, but we see other people that use their power to rule. So maybe we're seeing different elements about human nature. Human nature to confront mistreatment. Pharaoh feels like he's been wronged by Abram, and so he gets in his face and says, "You like essentially, you have committed an injustice against me. You lied to me, right? Um, it's human nature to honor marriage. He recognizes I'm Pharaoh, but I don't want to take this other man's wife, okay? What are God's ideals? I'm not going to say this is absolute, but here are some possibilities. Maybe God's idea was for Abram to trust him to provide food back in the the land of Israel. Maybe it was God's ideal for Abram to trust him to protect him in Egypt and not lie to Pharaoh. Maybe God's ideal was for them to tell the truth. Maybe God's idea was to bless the Egyptians through Abram instead of to have to bring these plagues on them because Abram deceived Pharaoh by lying about his wife. Maybe like God had said earlier in scene two, he really wanted to bless Egypt and he was bringing Abram and his family into Egypt for a while in a famine to bless Pharaoh. But Abram, he didn't trust God, so he ended up becoming a curse to Pharaoh instead of a blessing. 
Maybe God's idea was for Abram not to acquire so much wealth because that trips him up. And even the fact that he acquires slaves is how eventually uh, his, his wife convinces him to have an affair with one of these slave women to produce a child, scenes down the road. So there's things to think about with these stories, about humanity, about what God truly wants as well. Oops. Skipped over one thing, so I can go back. Okay. What might be motivating the characters? And this is where we have to look at characters and how they're acting. Maybe fear is motivating them. And we're looking at their behaviors. Well, they, dis- they, they feared death, perhaps, and that's why they resulted or resorted to deception. Maybe self-preservation. Maybe lust is a motive here with Pharaoh needing another beautiful woman. Maybe power. Maybe money is a motive. Maybe injustice. Maybe laziness. Like, there's a lot of possibilities. But it gets us to think about ourselves and to look in the mirror at ourselves in light of these different characters. But what might be motivating them? The Bible doesn't tell you because it wants to make you think. Uh, in the New Testament, it, the Bible is described as a book that's actually alive and active, and it's kind of searching you. And so God, it seems, if he's behind this book, if you believe that, maybe he's using it to cause you to search motives and to analyze behavior to find motives so that you can analyze your own behavior to to find your own motives or analyze other behavior around you to seek the deeper motive, perhaps. Last couple things this morning, if I can get it to click. What might be good, bad, wise, and unwise? It's like a grocery store aisle, right? The choices. Do I want the donut or do I want the, uh, you know, heart-healthy omelet? What am I going to do? Um, hmm. And you read these stories and you think, well, God doesn't spell it out. But he wants us to step back. And I think most of these situations, they cause us to step back to the position of Adam and Eve who are standing before this tree. And the question is, are you going to take this fruit that's symbolic of you making the decision like, no, God, I know better. This is good for me. Like, you've told me, stay away, but I know what's good for me. So I'm going to determine what's good and what's bad, and I'll I'll be the person that chooses that. That's how I want to live my life. Or are we going to step back and say, well, what... What is God seeming to say about what's good and bad and wise and unwise in this situation? Are we going to take life into our own hands and make all those determinations ourselves? Or are we going to step back and through these stories allow God to teach us a little bit more about his perspective of what's good and bad and wise and unwise by the way that these stories play out? I think that's the point, one of the points of many of these stories. And so maybe it's good and wise to trust God. Maybe it's good and wise to look way, for ways to bless other people instead of to possibly endanger other people like Abram did to Pharaoh. Maybe it's good and wise to tell the truth instead of just to deceive. Maybe it's bad to put my spouse at risk. Maybe that's not so wise. Maybe accumulating tons of beautiful wives or husbands is not such a great thing. Maybe having slaves is not such a great thing. So you begin to step back and go, well, in light of the story and how it plays out, what really is good and bad? What really would God say is wise and unwise? But he doesn't spell it out. He makes you think, and he makes you discover this. Uh, Final question for this morning. How should this story be shaping us and our communities? Because it's really not about individuals. Oftentimes, these stories... Uh, It's a we, it's an us, it's not just meant to change my life, it's meant for us in community to engage with these stories as families, as churches, um, as maybe neighborhoods, you know, and and as as church communities, as as communities like uh, towns, cities, things like that, you know, would be maybe an ideal. But how should the story be shaping us, not just me? So as we think about those questions, again, what does God think about what's good and bad? And how should that translate into how we live our lives as a family or as a church community or in this community? Um, How should we think 
collectively differently? What human tendencies do we need to be aware of? Not me, but us. Um, how are we treating other humans? Are we devaluing them? Are we looking at them as maybe possessions that other people will want to see and take or that we see and take? Or do we see people as image bearers of God? How does God want us to represent him to other people? Was Abram doing a good job of representing God to Pharaoh? Or do we have some things to learn from that? Should we imitate Abram as a community of people who want to represent God? Or should we uh, go the opposite way and model something different? Are we living by faith? Are we trusting God in the bigger picture of things? Are we blessing our community? Or are we bringing problems into our community and the people that we're living among? All these are the bigger, the deeper questions. Because God doesn't just want to tell you a neat story in a children's Bible. He wants you to think about how those characters and their decisions should affect us and the way that we live in our community and with each other and in our, our world. So that's the bigger picture. So how can we discover the messages that are intended in these stories? We can ask those kinds of questions and others as well. But if we just isolate scenes then we're going to miss out on many of the important messages that the bigger picture of the story was intended to give us. So just a few tips. I put those questions uh, in your bulletin. If you have one of these, you took one of them with you this morning. As a reminder, um, again, those are not the only questions you can ask. Those are just some things that will kind of steer you in the right direction as you engage these stories in the Bible. It's much more complex than meets the eye. And there's so many things that these scenes when you look at the story as a whole, are intended to communicate to us and questions that they're meant to, to raise in our minds.